particularly as it relates to home ownership and wealth, what we, what we have to remember is that home ownership and wealth are so closely tied together in this country. And you talk about traditions of redlining and housing discrimination in this country. White home ownership rate in this country right now is 73.7%. Um, black home ownership rates are at 44%. And if you take, a, if you then listen to um, what Mahersa has just said, is that those home values in black neighborhoods. I lived, I lived in Atlanta for 15 years, and there are enclaves of black neighborhoods with million-dollar houses that um, during the housing crisis, those folks were at the risk of losing their homes. And these are people who are in the middle class, who are upper middle class, because their home values had not grown, right, only because they were in black neighborhoods. And so if you think about that on the, on, on the middle class and then an upper middle class of our, of our country and in our communities, the fragility of the black middle class is the untold horror story of what we talk about when we talk about the American dream, because many of us spend an, a ridiculous amount of money to go to college and to get degrees and to go out and get that good job, right? And we move into neighborhoods because we don't, we want to continue to have some modicum of cultural connection, right? And we move into great black neighborhoods or we move back to our own neighborhoods, right? And what ends up happening in, is that our ability to do the same things that our non-Hispanic white counterparts do with the same amount of money is totally different. Even for, even for African Americans who decide, I'm going to go out and start my own business. I'm not going to be a part of the corporate machine. 40% of the revenues from of Black-owned businesses are located in the five most vulnerable sectors. That includes leisure, hospitality, and retail. 40% of the revenues from Black-owned businesses come from these really, really vulnerable sectors of the community, and that's compared to 25% of the revenues of all U.S. businesses, right? And so it's not just that it's about where we live. It's about when we decide to, when we decide to go out and start our own businesses, what those businesses look like. And when you look at folks who are, who are out there, who are making, who are making money, who are not um, running their own businesses, Black Americans are also vastly overrepresented um, in ten, um, ten of the uh, nine of the ten lowest paid, high contact essential services. Right, so Black folks are disproportionately represented in nine of the ten high touch essential services. And that only exacerbates, based on U.S. labor um, statistics and McKinsey, that only exacerbates our exposure and potential detriment of this disease to us. So you think about that, limited access to high-wage jobs. Many of us are essential. We're talking about grocery, food service, custodial. Um, we cannot stay at home. Largely, African Americans cannot stay at home. Black workers are the last hired and oftentimes the first fired. And black families don't have the same safety net that our non-Hispanic white counterparts have, right? And so it leads you to the point to where, where you have to say black folks are on the front lines of making sure that we all get food, that the food supply is still there, all of those things. If we are these essential workers, what is the government proposing to guarantee these people these I, I look at i look at essential workers just like i look at 9 11 first responders the government needs to have a program and a plan for essential workers and essential um these essential workers that how are they going to how are we going to guarantee that they're going to be compensated for their service and that their health and their financial stability they're going to be protected in perpetuity. What's the plan for that? Those are the things that we've got to ask our governments. We've got to demand that for them. And then I think, Drew, like, I love when you do numbers. It just, it makes my, my number-fearing heart so happy. But I think we also have to recognize 
reconcile with what happens if we cannot make this system do that, right? So we often say, Karen, you know, I've often said that we as communities of African descent who are still here in the United States, when there were a few key decision-making points where our ancestors had the choice to stay or to leave, those of us who are here who trace our roots back here, we descended from those who chose to stay. And I think that history would suggest that we, yes, pressure this government to do everything that Drew just said, but then our plan A, because I actually think that's plan B, our plan A has to be what what happens when the government refuses to do so? What happens when they say, you know what, racism is sort of going to be factored into our cost of doing business? Uh, we've seen that where the Supreme Court said, yeah, I know you've got statistics that show that racism contributes to more black people going to the death penalty or getting incarcerated. But, you know, we're not going to entertain that right now because it would make fixing the criminal justice system too burdensome. So we have to be clear that it is our responsibility to pressure the government to do that. But it is also our responsibility to Kujichagalia, that second principle of Kanza, which talks about self-determination. What do we do? How do we respond? What is our plan when the government says, mm, not interested, not mm. going to happen today?